a funny thing happens when I became a pastor. When I became a pastor, people stopped swearing around me. <laughs> or at least they tried to stop swearing around me. The, uh, my friends would occasionally swear, uh, and they just sort of look at me like, oops. I made a boo boo. The, the kids in our youth group, they're here, they they sometimes they start to swear and then they like switch mid word when they realize I'm there. One of them will like they'll stub their toe and be like, oh shucks. <laughs> Even my mom has started doing it. She, she would swear and then she goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that in front of you. My bad. <laughs> my mom. I am supposed to swear in front of my mom and she's supposed to get mad at me. She's not supposed to apologize to me for swearing. What is going on? My favorite instance, though, is I play hockey on Monday and Thursday nights in a community center with all of these kind of big, aggressive, jock guys. <laughs> and none of them knew I was a pastor because they're just random people. I, I don't know them from outside. And they just swear, and swear, and swear. It's all beep this, and beep that, and oh, pass the puck, or stop being such a beeping jerk. I'll say beep, so I won't get fired. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what these guys are talking about. If they can fit a four-letter word in front of it, they do it. <laughs> and one day, a few months ago, I was sitting on the bench waiting to play, and this guy was sitting next to me. And he was just swearing. He was talking about how hot this girl at work is and all the things he wants to do to her. And he was, he was talking about how much of a beat his boss is. And then he turns to me and he goes, so what do you do? <laughs> and I smiled because I knew this thing would come. I said, I'm going to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. He's like, no, I mean, where do you work? Oh, in a building. <laughs> what kind of building? It's a tall building. <laughs> He's like, come on, what kind of beeping job do you do? I'm a pastor. Huh. What? He's <laughs> like a priest. <laughs> he looked like I hit him over the head with a chicken. <laughs> His eyes were just shocked. As he started to replay in his head all the things he'd just been saying to me, and he, his eyes just went. And then, before he could even say anything, it was his turn to go on the, the to the play hockey. So he left, and I was left there sitting, and he never said anything to me ever again. <laughs> that was the end of our relationship. When I became a pastor, people stopped swearing around me, and I realized. It's because the main thing they associate in their head with Christianity and pastors and religion is a list of rules. The rules are you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal, you don't sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend before marriage, and you don't swear. Christianity is just a list of rules. Religion to them is all about the rules. Salvation is all about not swearing. God is a dictator in the clouds who tells you what to do. And if you don't do it, he sends you to hell or to live in Surrey. <laughs> I, bet, I bet some of you were uncomfortable with coming to this camp for that exact reason. Your friend kept bugging you year after year to come to our church camp, and you kept thinking, why do I want to have some crazy moralistic pastor yell at me for how I'm living my life? Religion is so restricting, it confines you to this rigid set of rules that don't let you breathe. You have to obey the Bible and the Ten Commandments. I just want to live my life the way I want to and be myself. I don't need all these extra rules on top of my already crazy life. 
And some of you are probably pretty justified in thinking that way. You, you came from churches where it really just was all about the rules. It was all about guilt and shame, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to pray and obey your parents and give money and be this kind of person. You have to fit into this mold of what being a Christian is. And when you realize you couldn't quite fit into that mold without sacrificing who you are, you took off. The rules were so restrictive, you have to get out. People think religion is all about the rules. And not swearing epitomizes that perhaps better than anything else. And that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that something that has completely changed my life can be reduced in society's mind to simply not swearing. It breaks my heart that the Bible, which has some of the most powerful stories of suffering and hope and humanity, has been reduced to a checklist of rules. It breaks my heart that coming into contact with the infinite creator of time and space has been reduced to not saying the F word. It breaks my heart. That the story of God coming down to die for us, perhaps the greatest story of love and sacrifice ever told, has been reduced to not using Jesus Christ as a swear word. It breaks my heart that the church has often become so focused on making people perfect that we've forgotten to love people when they're not perfect. It breaks my heart that the thing people associate the most with church and pastors and Christianity is guilt and morality and rules and not swearing. Yet that doesn't mean the rules are bad in and of themselves. I try not to swear. And I think I have pretty good reasons for that. And yes, in between the stories, the Bible does actually have quite a few rules. And I happen to believe they're actually pretty good rules. Rules I think more people should live by. I'm not saying the rules are dumb. The rules are part of religion for a reason. I'm not saying Christianity isn't about rules. What I am saying is that it's not just about the rules. In fact, it's not even primarily about the rules. It's not just about rules. I'm married. You should know that because it's the single most redeeming factor about me. <laughs> My wife's here, she's on the worship team, and she basically does all the things I'm too incompetent to do. And in our marriage, there are a bunch of rules. Don't leave the house without making the bed. Don't forget to feed the dog or he'll die. <laughs> Don't take a bite out of the taco, then put it back in the fridge, or you will die. <laughs> Don't lie to each other. Don't manipulate each other. Don't sleep around with other people. She hasn't ever actually said that one to me, but I figured it out. <laughs> In our marriage, there are rules, both spoken and unspoken rules, and those rules are there not to hurt us, but to help us have a happy and loving marriage. The rules are good. But our marriage is not just about rules. We didn't get married for the purpose of following the rules. We got married because we were in love. And because she needed a Canadian visa. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling that in this particular demographic, you understand this concept. <laughs> It's not about the rules. It 
It's about the joy and passion and the intimacy of truly knowing another person. It's about struggling through life together, fighting off the bills and the rent like there are evil overlords, and we do it together. Laughing and crying and pissing each other off and then making up and all this messy, crazy stuff that all comes together. It's about that. It's not just about the rules. It's about relationships. And if someone looked at our marriage and thought, wow, they do sure follow every rule in the marriage books, you know what? That'd be great. But if that was all there was, if we just followed the rules but there was no love between us, that would break my heart. Because it's not just about the rules, it's about relationships. If someone looked at our marriage and they saw the rules, that'd be good. We want to follow the rules. But it's not just about the rules. It's about relationship. And one day, Madison and I will eventually have children. Not anytime soon. Stop getting excited, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> and if, like 30 years from now, our kids were grown up. And we taught them how to be moral, polite people, then that would be great. But if they grew up and became moral, polite people who had no idea how much we loved them, it would break my heart. Frankly, I'd rather have a kid who swore every 10 seconds but knew in their heart that they were loved than a kid whose English is all proper and polished, but feels alone in the world. Because it's not just about rules, it's about relationship. Instilling the rules into a child's heart is a good thing, but it doesn't mean squat if they don't know they're loved. And it's the same thing with God. Our religion has rules, and I think they're mostly good rules, and perhaps if you want we can sit down over coffee and debate about the rules because they fascinate me. But religious rules are here to protect us and nurture us and help us grow. A mother tells her child not to run across the busy street because she wants to protect them. And in the same way, God gives us rules not to inhibit us but to protect us. The rules are good. It's about relationship. God wants a relationship with us. With me. With you. In the Bible, in Romans 8, it says, Neither death nor life, neither the present nor the future, nor any worldly power, Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all the world will be able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. That's in the Bible. Nothing in all the world can separate us from God's love. Does that sound like a checklist of rules to you? Does that sound like the words of a moralistic, judgmental, rule-driven dictator in the clouds to you? See, some people, they read the Bible like it's a list of laws they have to memorize and follow. But when I read the Bible, I read it like I read a love letter. A love letter from God to humanity. I see words on a page that is covered with tears. I see letters written not in ink, but with blood. Blood that God sacrificed for me, like a mother sacrificing herself for a child. I don't just see commandments and rules. I see declarations of love. God wants a relationship with us. 
Isn't that insane? If you're so, we're so used to hearing it, you'd stop and go, what? The master of the universe wants me. The brilliant God who knows everything wants to know me. The one who forged the trees and the stars and the ladybugs wants to forge a place in your heart. The creator of everything wants to create a relationship with you. I mean, forget about some crush or some boy or some girl you like. Who, who cares what they think in comparison to what the creator of the entire universe thinks of you? Oh, God, Beepin loves you. <laughs> Religion is not just about rules, it's about relationship, a relationship with God. Which is why it breaks my heart when I see Christians who follow all the rules, but they're just going through the motions. Their heart isn't in it. There's no sense of relationship with God. That's why it breaks my heart when the primary thing people associate with a pastor when they meet me is, oops, I better not swear, as if that's what God really cares about. It breaks my heart when church becomes just about morality and guilt trips, and we lose sight of the love that longs for us, the love of a God who would die for us like a lover jumping in front of a bullet for their love. It breaks my heart when we read the Bible like an instruction manual and miss that nothing in all the world can separate us from the love of God that is ours for Christ Jesus. I would rather have a Christian who swore every 10 seconds but knew in their heart that they were loved by God than a Christian whose language is all proper and polished but feels alone in the universe. Because it's not just about the rules. It's about relationship. God wants a relationship with you. And that sounds weird, doesn't it? What kind of relationship? Is this a cult? How does one go about pursuing a relationship with God? It's not like there's an internet dating site where you can pick a God and go out. What would a relationship with God even look like? What does that mean on a practical level? How do you develop a relationship with God? Well, first, you need to buy my book. We have copies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one day, that no. <laughs> We're not selling anything. <laughs> How do you have a relationship with God? How do you initiate that? What are, what are the steps you take? Well, first you need to pray and read the Bible. That sounds so typical, doesn't it? And polite and churchy and almost like another rule that I've sneakily slipped in there. But see, the reason we read the Bible and pray is entirely relationship driven. It's about communication. The Bible is how God communicates his thoughts and desires and longings and hopes to us. The Bible is page after page of God revealing who he is to us so we can know his heart. And prayer is how we communicate back to God. It's how we enter into this eternal heavenly dialogue like almost a conversation over coffee at a coffee shop. Communication is the key to relationship, and the Bible and prayer are key to communicating with God. If you're not reading the Bible or praying, you need to have the first baby steps down towards a relationship, so no wonder you don't feel close to God, no wonder you feel alone. You're not communicating. There's a breakdown in communication, just like if I stopped talking to my wife for a few months, and then I suddenly wondered, hey, why don't you like me anymore? 
Duh, stupid husband, because you're not communicating with me. You're not talking to me. You're not listening to me. There's no relationship here. It's the same thing. Read your Bible. Listen to what God is trying to share with you. Then share who you are with him through prayer. Second, you need to learn how you personally relate to God. Relationships are a unique thing, right? Each couple connects in different ways. The one-liners I used on my previous girlfriends did not work with my future wife. Very sadly. Everyone relates in different ways. Some couples connect through hobbies, through movies, through shared interests. We all have different love languages. Some people feel close when they're in deep conversations, and other people don't feel close for conversations. They feel close for just sitting and holding each other's hands and being together. They don't need all the words. Some people need gifts that show your affection and thoughtfulness. Other people just want your time. We all have unique relationship styles, and that's not just true in how we relate to other people, but in how we relate to God. We all have unique ways of connecting to God and knowing and experiencing God. Through me, I experience God through nature. I mean, this summer camp is awesome for me spiritually. The smell of the trees, the flicker of the sun off the lake, the feel of the grass pressing down beneath your feet, the sound of silence away from the cars, and the city streets. God created nature so we can experience God through it. In the same way that after you read a really good book, you almost feel like you've gotten to know the author. You've entered into the way they think and express, and you feel like you almost know J.K. Rowling through reading Harry Potter, don't you? <laughs> and it's the same thing with nature. Nature connects us with its author, God. But what about you? How do you connect to God? Some of you connect through serve. You show love to people by doing little things for them, or helping them out with last minute chores, or making them little gifts. And it's the same thing with how you relate to God. Some of you will feel closer to God, close to God only when you're serving, when you're volunteering, when you're helping set up chairs, when you're feeding homeless people, or volunteering. For others of you, you more experience God through worship and song. Singing out loud, lungs pumping, hands raised, you feel like you've plugged in your soul to some cosmic force, and you're finally saying hello to God as an old friend who you haven't seen for years because you've been lost in the unmusical reality of daily life. Perhaps you experience God through poetry, exercise, or sports. Perhaps you relate to God through gardening, or reading, or painting, or running. We are physical creatures who feel close through touch, and hugs, and kisses. And so in a weird way, when our bodies are engaged in doing physical, artistic, bodily things in God's creation, it's almost like we're hugging God. Perhaps you relate to God through Sabbath, through rest, through being still. There's a famous monk who said that sometimes the most spiritual thing a person can do is to take a nap. Some of you are like, Amen. <laughs> Perhaps you connect to God most through other people through seeing God at work in other people's lives, through feeling God's reassuring hand through the support of a loving friend. Whatever your unique relationship style is in a way of connecting to God, figure out what it is and do it. Make the time on a regular basis and do those things with God. 
Just like you make the time on a regular basis to hang out with friends and develop a relationship with your family and loved ones, God loves you and he wants a relationship with you, but if you don't spend time with him, you don't communicate with him, don't do things that bring you closer, you're shutting him out of your life. You don't swear? Good. You follow the rules? Great. But that doesn't mean much if you're not getting to know the God who wrote those rules in the first place. Because it's not just about the rules. It's about relationship. You might be a decent person. You don't steal from your office or cheat on your exam or lie to your friends. You might follow all the rules, but it doesn't mean squat if you don't believe you are loved. You will go from person to person, place to place, and thing to thing, searching in vain for meaning and identity and value, because there is a God-shaped hole in your heart, and nothing in this world can truly fill it. Not money, or success, or status, or romance, or video games, none of it can fill that God-shaped hole in your heart, no matter how hard you try to stuff it in. You might be a relatively decent person. Yeah, you have a few vices here and there, but mostly I try to be good. But even the best people still look up out at that night sky and wonder if they are alone in the universe. Because we are not computer programs that were created just to follow commands and obey the rules. No, we long for more. We were made for relationship, for relationship with the infinite, with the one who started it all, the relationship with our maker. We were made to look up at the night sky and know that loving eyes are looking back. Know that we are watched over and cared for. Know that we are not alone down here on this rock floating through the infinite abyss of space. Following the rules is a good thing, but it doesn't mean squat if you don't know your love. Love by an incredible, absolute, infinite, godlike love that never ceases. A love that continues after death and on into eternity. That kind of love redeems you, redefines you. That gives you the self-worth and value you've been chasing after your whole life. That kind of love gives you the affirmation you never found from other humans. A love that loves so deeply it would die for you and that on a cross. 